Good morning, welcome, or rather good day. Welcome to the Institute for Critical Study of Society, at, also known by its acronym ICSS, well known by now for its Sunday morning program at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library. Now we're not actually at the library today uh, because since COVID started, we have been doing it remotely. Once in a while, we do a program there. My name is Raj Sahai. ICSS was formed at the Nebel Proctor Marxist Library in 2004 to preserve Marxist heritage and to support struggles for social justice and communism. So uh, just for everybody's knowledge, we are recording this session and later in, in, the, pro, later in the week, it'll be posted on our channel in YouTube, which is ICSS Marxist. It'll also be available on uh, ICSSMarx.org, our website. So um, the opinions expressed in our forum are only those of its authors, mm -hmm. but we are all united in our respect for the work of the great genius, Karl Marx, who in his 11th thesis on Farbach said, the philosophers have interpreted the word in different ways. The point, however, is to change it. So that's the spirit from, uh, on which, which motivates us. Uh, and Sharat is certainly part of it. Today's topic is one year into the war in, in Ukraine. And the world has been redivided, says Sharat, into two progressively decoupling camps, and seemingly we are in a new Cold War. Meanwhile, each camp is being drawn more tightly together. While the war be began, at least as presented to us by the mass media, uh, suddenly on February 24, 2022, almost a year and coming up to one month, uh, its preconditions were a long time in the making. Was it really an unprovoked war as it is re relentlessly presented? While this is one of the number of globally televised wars, how is the Ukraine war different from others? Whose interests does it serve? These are the question uh, Sharath has posed and, and I, I expect he will answer. So a little bit, uh, um, about the format, we will, uh, Sharad will speak as is our usual format in the first hour. We will have a brief intermission for, for announcements and then have questions and comments from our audience in the second hour. Our, our program will end at 12.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time and before which we'll ask our, our guest speaker to give his final thoughts. So uh, we'll not entertain a question after around 12.25 or 24 or something like that. Okay, uh, Sharad Lin, our speaker today, will, uh, uh, will examine the root causes of the conflict and how peace can be brought about and how the war is forging a new world order. So that's the content uh, today you should expect from this talk. Sharat's background, he completed his PhD at UC Berkeley in biomedical science many a decade back, and he's a political economist as well. He's presently a research fellow with Human Agenda and the Initiative for Equality, and has been an organizer and active participant at the San Jose Peace and Justice Center and the Initiative for Equality. He has traveled widely all over the world, and I will be hard pressed to tell you where he has not gone. Well, gone will be easier to tell you how many places he has not gone because there will be fewer than the places he has gone. He writes and lectures on global political economy, labor migration, social movements, and public health. He has studied producer-owned cooperatives in Spain, Cuba, Venezuela, India, and the US. He has observed first and many temporary experiments in self-organization 
as well as state enterprise in both capitalist, socialist, and hybrid states. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sharat Lin to the ICSS Sunday morning. Take it away, Sharat. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Araj. Thank you very much to, to the Institute for the Critical Study of Society for, for keeping these uh, Sunday mornings going for, for or I think more than, well, this is decades now, isn't it? Uh, anyway, it's, it's an amazing uh, um, thing that you're, you're keeping going. And, and thank you everyone for, for, for being here. <clears throat> so uh, today, uh, you know, is the uh, March 19th uh, is, is the, uh, the anniversary, the, the 20th anniversary of the, the US invasion of Iraq. So uh, it, it's a very, uh, um, you know, it's kind of a, a, a sad day, but but of course this this day represents, uh, you know, just another another uh, example of <clears throat> the U.S. Uh, the U.S.'s attempt to to uh, to dominate the world and and to impose its its almost arbitrary will. Uh, on the rest of the world, um, and um, this is, of course, we have just passed the the first anniversary of the of Russia's uh, invasion of of Ukraine, the start of the Ukraine war on on the twenty fourth of February, uh, twenty twenty two, uh, and so it's it's a good time to to take a look at at where we are to assess what has happened. To uh, try to um, you know improve our, our understanding of of how we got here and, and how do we get out of it? Where are we headed? Um, this is this is a, a something that you know really is on people's minds just because we we are at an inflection point, another inflection point in history, where uh, you know we're shifting from from globalization to a to a redivision of the world. Uh, and it's to me, it's of course very unfortunate, very unsettling. Uh, today is also the day that, according to the original schedule, you you, you folks at the ICSS were to uh, supposed to have a talk from from Scott Ritter. And uh, Scott Ritter, as most of you know, is a, a, a weapons inspector, a military expert. And I don't fully agree with him. I mean, he he would have if he had been here today, he would have told you uh, more about the military aspects of the war. Uh, he would be telling you that uh, that Russia is winning this war. And uh, he would even correct himself and say he's, he would even say that, that uh, Russia has already won. And I don't see that. I, I see that uh, militarily it's, it's more or less a stalemate. Of course, Russia has more resources to to pursue this this war over the long run, but on the other hand, Ukraine has the has the the backing of the of the Western powers, and then particularly the United States, which have you know um, much much larger economies than Russia's. So uh, the the outcome of the war is is by by no means determined at this point, in, in my view, and uh, <clears throat> the. Um, there's, uh, there's 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 a lot that that could still happen. <laughs> so um, I, I want to I'm going to get started by by sharing my screen. <clears throat> Let me see how I can do that. Okay. Let's go to slideshow. All right. So I, I'm going to talk, uh, as I have in, in, in many cases with, with previous wars, like the U.S. war in Iraq, to talk about the, you know, the, the, the root causes of war, because that's what we really need to understand in, in order to understand the situation, how we got here, is what were the root causes, not just what happened on, on February 24th, uh, 2022. So... You know the the a lot of what we we uh, we see today is uh, in, in our media 
not just in U.S. media, but in, in Western media in, in, in general, is a, a particular framing of the war in Ukraine that, that I find to be extremely problematic, extremely one-sided, extremely distorted. And, and the first is, is that, that this is, and this is re repeated relentlessly, relentlessly that uh, Russia's uh, invasion is, is unprovoked. And um, the fact is that, that, that this is a, 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 what happened last year is an outcome of a long process that uh, you go back to the, to the uh, Russia's uh, taking of, uh, of Crimea, you look back to the Euro, Euromaidan uprising, uh, you look at a, at a long history of pipeline politics and, 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 uh, and much before that. So um, uh, it's, it's not unprovoked. Uh, there, there, is, there is a lot of history to, to look at um, before of what happened last year. The second is, is that is also relentlessly repeated is Russia's full-scale invasion. Now, this concept of full scale has perhaps different meanings to different people, but but I think the original intent of the, the this terminology full scale was to was to was to differentiate it from from uh, Russia's uh, uh, taking of, of of Crimea back in 2014, which was a, a very limited operation. But it's it's not a full scale war in the sense that that the uh, in the sense of World War II, in, even in the sense of Vietnam or, or the, the Korean War, uh, where the United States, for example, would carpet bomb cities. So Berlin, Pyongyang, uh, Tokyo, these, these, these cities were, were, were literally level. There was, there was hardly a building that, that was standing in, in, many of these, uh, in many of these cities. Russia has not done that. Russia has used uh, missile strikes, is, it has used artillery, uh, and the Ukrainians, of course, have done the same. Uh, but Russia has not, by and large, used its air force, except in the, in the early days of the war. Um, the, the Russian air force has not been used. And so you don't have this carpet bombing, this, 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 this you know, sweeping destruction. Uh, despite the fact, that, I mean, of course, it's true that, that, that the devast whatever the bombing happens is is devastating to a civilian population. It's horrifying. Uh, there there are th tens of thousands of people who have died, and and this is something that 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 is a humanitarian catastrophe. Um, but we have to put it in perspective and keep it in perspective. Um, and then the notion that it's that's Putin's war, and of course this is part of demonization, right? That that to, it is to attribute a war to one person. Uh, you know, when when the U.S. invaded Iraq, it was it was it was never just Bush's war, right? Right? It was it was the the military's war, the the uh, the, uh, the 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 deep state that that determined that that the U, that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, and so on and so forth. But uh, when it's the other side, it's always one person, one one man. Um, and then the the uh, the uplifting of of Zelensky as a as a hero, <laughs> a hero for the for the world for the year, um, despite the fact that. That he's presiding over a country that is turning a blind eye to to uh, to neo Nazis, to uh, to extreme right right movements, uh, and and really what I think is an emerging um, a chaos of of uh, of arms and militias. But we'll get into that. Uh, the notion of Ukraine's territorial integrity. Um, you know, when, when do we say that, uh, that a, a country has um, uh, territorial integrity is, is uh, when there, there is some, you know, particular characteristics that, 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 that those boundaries are sacred. 
are either because there's a long history to those boundaries or because those boundaries represent a, a you know, one particular nationality. Uh, in the case of Ukraine, there are, there are you know, minority groups and, and, and many areas, particularly in the south and the, and the uh, east, that are, which have a majority of Russian speaking, Russian speakers, people who do not consider themselves to be ethnic U Ukrainians. Um, another one, of course, is the, the Russian war crimes. And uh, a lot of these war crimes are, indeed are real. We all remember Bucha. We remember, um, um, you know, so many things that, that are happening here. But we often um, are not told about, about Ukrainian war crimes. Now get into some of those as well. So this so war is is a is a a, a field where war crimes are, are 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 committed by by both sides and uh, even though the, i i do think that the some of the russian war crimes are are i'm, I'm kind of surprised at at, uh, at at what is at what is happening and the magnitude of this uh which is terrifying and then, and then, in contrast to that, the narrative that the Ukrainians are all freedom fighters. So, um, you know, some of the assumptions that are, that are made uh, in the in the Western narrative is, are that that Russia and China are are necessarily our, our adversaries, and, and um, you know, during the period of globalization. We were we were able to uh, to collaborate economically, to trade, to invest, and uh, why are they suddenly being turned into adversaries? I feel that this is a this is an artificial construct that that is um, being advanced to uh, to uh, try to preserve U.S. hegemony by by putting down the others, by finding pretexts to to act against the others. Uh, at first, with uh, with sanctions, with uh, uh, limitations uh, uh, on investment, uh, and um, and then eventually, uh, you know, leading more and more towards a military confrontation. Um, NATO expansion is about the common defense against threats to Western security. Well, if you look at you know, I, I want to talk a little bit about NATO because. Because um, you know, let's let's go back to the, the the NATO was created as as a for this reason uh, when uh, at the time of the Soviet Union and uh, at the time that uh, that the Soviet bloc, uh, the, you know, including the other East European countries, uh, were part of the Warsaw Pact. So you had these two giant military alliances, NATO and the Warsaw Pact. And when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, Gorbachev, you know, uh, approached Reagan and uh, and said that you know uh, I really want to to see an era of peace, and uh, you know we we are going to dissolve the the Warsaw Pact, and we would like to see NATO also be dissolved. So we eliminate the two military alliances. And and, uh, and initiate a, an era of of peace and cooperation in Europe. Uh, Reagan, of course, refused, and uh, Warsaw Pact collapsed. But and NATO continued. What has NATO been used for in in the years since then? And well, it it was used in the Balkans, um, in essence, to to break up the former Yugoslavia. Um, it was used. Uh, the the U.S. Um, convinced NATO to to um, to be the the cover for the U.S. invasion of Afghanistan in 2001. It tried to get NATO to do the same thing in 2003 to invade Iraq. Um, it could not get that consensus, so it went ahead anyway. And and then in Libya. Uh, NATO was was uh, used to to invade Libya, topple Muammar Gaddafi, and uh, what we are left with is um, here we are, uh, twelve years after the uh, uh, that invasion, 
and Libya is still in a civil war uh, to this day. Not only is it in a civil war, but the but the arms that were poured into Libya uh, had had been flowing into Syria, fueled the the the, 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 the war in Syria, the proxy wars in, in Syria, and and uh, in 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 other parts of the Middle East. So it, all of this has been, you know. Um, stirring the pot. Um, then there's the notion that, that, that in particularly under Trump, that uh, US allies need to increase their share of defense spending. Because Trump was saying that, well, you know, the US spends uh, a larger percentage of its, of its GDP on defense than, than the other Western so-called allies do. And so the US could reduce its defense spending if the other countries increase theirs, particularly Germany, Japan, um, and, and these countries. Again, Russia's invasion was unprovoked. I, I have already talked about that, Ukraine's and territorial integrity. We'll get into the, some of the details there uh, in my talk. Um, and then the defense of Ukraine is about upholding Western values of democracy. And, and its fight for for existence and existential fight for existence. Well, first of all, there's no evidence that 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 Russia uh, had any uh, intent to to take over the entirety of, of Ukraine. What uh, we, what we need to do is is carefully examine from its actions and from its from its perspective what the Russian objectives were in Ukraine. Um, from from 2014 um, onwards, okay, and and then the other final one is the is the this concept of of uh, a, a, an historical conflict between between democracy and authoritarianism, and uh, I believe that this is a is a is a false you know dichotomization of the world. I mean, democracy. The, the the implementations of democracy, the implementations of elections around the world vary a great deal, and uh, and one of the things that uh, that Raj did not mention in my bio is that is that in recent years I have become a an official election observer in in many countries as well as in several states in the U.S. And one one thing I will say about about elections and democratic functioning is that. Is that there are many nuances. Their uh, elections are 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 almost universal uh, around the world, but uh, how democratic they are uh, depends on the electoral processes and then also the political processes. It's a complex uh, problem that you know maybe I'll discuss in a, in, a, in another talk, but it I feel it's it's really impossible and unrealistic. To dichotomize the world into into democracy versus authoritarian um, states, and it's not and it's not helpful. So, the, some of the questions that we want to answer today are: Why did the war start? What are the root causes of this war? How has the the news been covered, and and why is this influential? Why does the U.S. never talk about a ceasefire? Is peace possible? How do we get to peace? How does this war end? How is this, this war changing the world? Perhaps in, in some ways that, that are unintended. And, and who are the winners and losers? Because that often tells you something about motivations. Okay. Um, just a reminder that, that um, you know, we, we call it Ukraine uh, in, in all of our discussions in, in English. But uh, the Ukrainians and the Russians call it Ukraina, and uh, you see that uh, these these two languages are 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 uh, have a lot in common, more in common than than they have differences. And um, um, so so why the crisis? What are, what are some of the root causes? Well, one of them, you know, when we talk about NATO expansion. Um, the, the, the two countries that, that now have applications for, for NATO membership are Ukraine and, and Georgia. Both, both of them were, were former uh, Soviet republics. And uh, remember that, that NATO was conceived as a, as a European alliance 
and uh, and you see that Georgia is the uh, is a country that is not even in Europe. It, it, it's it's uh, it's east of Turkey, uh, Turkey, I should say, um, and um, and so for Russia, this is this is a threat because it's because it is expanding but beyond its eastern borders into its Asian borders, and uh, it, it could be it's a stepping stone to to surrounding Russia in what, what I sometimes call its, its soft underbelly uh, of, of Central Asia. Um, because, because, you know, Russia has, has uh, experienced defending the, the West, right? From, from, from Hitler's invasions. Uh, it has a lot of, uh, it's, it's a harder defense uh, on, on the West than, than from the South. And um, so, so this is, this is the, the 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 feeling of of encirclement. So, but let you know the um, the the, uh, the the contention between between Russians and Ukrainians that goes back in 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 history. I mean, when the when the Bolshevik Revolution took place, you had the these Russian troops, mem the the um, uh, Red Army, uh, coming down to uh, to liberate. Uh, the uh, the area that is that is today Ukraine, and um, and they fought uh, uh, some battles in, in in some places. Now the the red flags here. This is a this is a, a Bolshevik map, and and uh, the red flags indicate areas where where there were um, uh, substantial um, armies of the of the Red Army. Uh, troops of the Red Army. The black flags uh, indicate areas of, of armed resistance. And uh, the, the, the most intense areas of armed resistance were in fact in this in the south uh, around the Sea of Azov. And uh, you see in the in the upper left is uh, is Kiev. So Kiev was was one center of resistance. The, the black flag at the in the in the lower center is uh, Simferopol, the the capital of uh, of Crimea, and uh, the one in in the lower right is uh, Ekaterinodar, which is today's Krasnodar, uh, that is in Russia, and but anyway these are these are were the areas of of the, the most intense resistance. So there's there is some history here. Uh, of animosity between Ukrainians and 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 Russians. In terms of the of the borders, the borders of of Ukraine, as a as a, um, a state of of the of the Soviet Union, have changed over the years. And so, uh, in, in 1918, uh, it, it looked something like this. And in 1922, when it it formally became a for the first time a a a, um, a, a socialist republic of, of Russia, the Ukrainian uh, Soviet socialist uh, uh, or rather republic. Um, it had these borders, and, and Crimea was not included. And uh, Crimea was not included because it was a it, it was a majority Russian uh, ethnic Russian area. And it was only later on uh, that that Stalin uh, decided to uh, to uh, include it in Crimea for administrative reasons, because because it was connected by land to uh, to to uh, uh, Ukraine, and uh, and at that time there was no bridge, you know, across the the, the mouth of the of the Sea of Azov. Um, this is a very interesting election in 2012, the presidential election. So the, this one is, is one that, that really illustrates sort of the, the, the peak of the, of the political divide in, in Ukraine, uh, in which the, uh, the, 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 the rightist and, and the Ukrainian nationalist parties are in pink. They won these, uh, uh, these districts. And uh, and the blue 
represents the, the more pro-Russian, the uh, uh, center-left parties, uh, completely dominating the East and the South. And uh, so you see that, that in 2012, Ukraine was, a, was geographically, politically very, very divided. And, uh, and this was sort of the, the, uh, the, the, the grounds that, that, that uh, well, I mean, Viktor Yanukovych became president and uh, it was the, the um, uh, and he could win that, you know, those, uh, those elections because, because of these, these geographic political divisions that existed at the time. And, um, but that was unacceptable to, to the right. It was also unacceptable to the United States. And, uh, and so uh, the United States government through, principally through the, through the National Endowment for Democracy, um, provided a, a lot of assistance to the, to the, uh, the groups in Ukraine, the right-wing groups that were protesting against Viktor Yanukovych. And, uh, and this was uh, the, the Euromaidan uprising that began in November of 2013. And um, the, the, the Euromaidan uprising, um, uh, of course, overthrew Viktor Yanukovych and, um, and uh, that brought in a, a more right-wing, a nationalist government in, in Ukraine uh, that, that um, had on its agenda um, in no uncertain terms that, that Ukraine should join NATO. And, and that was a, a, a real threat to, to Russia for the following reason. I mean, there are many other reasons, but, the, but this is the one that, that really has not been talked about. And, and that is that, that if you look at Russia's naval bases, not only naval bases, but, but ports, okay? Um, the, the, uh, the, the ports that, that the Soviet Union had, okay? There were, there were four major ports. In, in the Soviet Union, and, and those are Vladivostok in the in the east, Saint Petersburg, or at that time Leningrad in the north, and Kaliningrad, both of them on the Baltic Sea, and and uh, Sebastopol in Crimea. Uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Kaliningrad what got cut off because it, it's not contiguous with the rest of Russia. Uh, and so there's no land communication between Kaliningrad and the rest of Russia. That leaves St. Petersburg and Vladivostok. Vladivostok is for the Pacific. St. Petersburg is a cold water port. There's, there's, there can be ice blocking St. Petersburg. You need ice, ice, bur ice breakers to, to, uh, to keep that port open. So that left Sebastopol. So Sebastopol is the only warm water port for for Russia, and and it's part of Crimea. If if Ukraine had gone to NATO, that S Russia would have lost its Sebastopol naval base and, and that port. The only other port it has in warm waters is Latakia, and that's that's in Syria. So so this underlines why why it was so important for and Russia, which is still a a major. Military power, not only not only number one in nuclear weapons, but also uh, still has one of the largest navies in the world. So it, it was an existential threat to uh, to um, uh, to Russia. Uh, let's see how do I? What's this? It's not advancing. There we go. So Crimea, Crimea, of course, is a is a uh, a majority uh, Russian Russian speaking region, um, and this was another reason why why when Russia took over, uh, there, there was support. There was there was uh, political support for it locally. Uh, it didn't have to fight uh, a lot of rebellions uh, inside Crimea. And, and the, the, the Russians were majority in, in all districts of, of Crimea, not just some. Now, 
Um, this this is this is just to remind us of of how you know President Biden has exacerbated the crisis by by continuing to to emphasize that um, that that the U.S. commitment to NATO and uh, th this was his uh, his remarks to the to the um, the conference of the Bucharest Nine. Uh, in Warsaw, you know, around the, the the first anniversary of the war, as some of you may remember, years ago, when we were expanding NATO, I was the one in the U U.S. Senate who was pushing the hardest to expand NATO for membership for many of you sitting around this table. So, you know, it, it, Biden has been uh, is, has been uh, uh, unabashed about uh, about uh, his his support for NATO expansion. Uh, you know, despite the consequences, and I, I cannot, uh, you know, avoid the sense that that this is deliberate, that that he knows what he's doing. Certainly, his defense establishment, his security establishment, knows what he's doing, and and that this is a deliberate attempt to uh, to 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 provoke Russia to to create a conflict, to create a new Cold War that will become a pretext. For for sanctioning and 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 constricting Russia and and then and then also China. Uh, in in terms of you know war crimes, we're going to talk a little bit about the ICC decision later on, but I want to mention this uh, also as part of it, and and that is that that you know in the years um, between uh, you know when, when you had uh, Lugansk. Uh, or Luhansk in, in Ukrainian, Lugansk in Russian, and, and Donetsk. These these two provinces um, break away from from uh, Ukraine in 2014. Uh, there was a, uh, a a a line of control that you see the the sort of the heavy uh, red areas represent the the line of control. And, and these red dots are the are the people killed by by mines. Now, now mines are are outlawed by the uh, by a, a, a UN convention on, uh, against landmines. Uh, unfortunately, neither Russia nor Ukraine are are signatories to the landmine treaty, and and, and so th there's widespread use of mines, which are which are under that treaty considered considered war crimes. But you see that what, what I want you to, to take, the takeaway message from this is that, is that there are a roughly equal number of, of, well, actually there are more casualties. There are more, there are more people who died from landmines on, on, the, on, the, on the, 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 uh, the breakaway, the, the pro-Russian side of the, of the line of control than on the Ukrainian side of the line of control. So just, just keep that in mind. Next, you know, is the is the the issue of, of what I call pipeline politics, the, the geopolitics of pipelines. So this map is is to illustrate the how extensive the, the natural gas pipelines are from Russia into Europe. And and for, for decades, you know, Russia has been the the main source of natural gas for for both Eastern and, and Western Europe. Through a myriad of, of pipelines, and uh, about half of these pipelines uh, go through Ukraine. So Ukraine has been a, a a critical transit point for for Russian natural gas. And it, it the historically the, the, these pipelines have not only supplied natural gas to Ukraine itself, but have provided uh, transit revenues uh, for Ukraine. And uh, and then you see up in the in the in the upper part. I don't know whether you can see this cursor uh, on your screens, but but you see this this pipeline. This this is uh, this is Nord Stream One. So so Nord Stream run, One runs from you know close to to Saint Petersburg out to um, uh, to to northern Germany. Okay, it enters here you know near near Rostock. And um, uh, and 
the the U.S. has has you know when when it started the, this politics about about supporting Ukraine, and, and this is long before 2014. Uh, the U.S. was concerned about about uh, Nord Stream One, and wanted to limit you know Germany's dependence on on Russia through Nord Stream One. Even though Germany also receives uh, natural gas through the through this one, um, uh, through, through the the this is the Druzhba pipeline, um, and um, the, but but the issue was that that the U.S. wanted to to break Western Europe away from Russian dependence, but there were no alternatives at the time. I mean, Norway could supply some. Uh, the U.S. at that time um, did not have uh, shale gas. And, and we didn't certainly didn't have any ex the, the export cap capability. Uh, today it's all different. I mean, the the, the shale gas is is uh, is is the uh, the big swing producer for the world, and um, and so the the U.S. today is is uh, has become along with Norway the, the the largest supplier of natural gas to to Western Europe. Um, anyway, the. The issue of Nord Stream Two, the U.S. was opposed to the construction of Nord Stream Two from the from the start. So this this is around 2011, when when Russia began Gazprom began the construction of Nord Stream Two, and the argument the the open the argument was for the by the U.S. was that Nord Stream Two would deprive Ukraine of transit revenues. That was the the other reason, other than you know, German dependence. And, um, and so, uh, uh, so, the, so the, that was a, um, another reason for, for, for starting a war, because then, because then when you have a war, you, you have a pretext for shutting down the, the, the both Nord Stream pipelines. Uh, look, look at which which European uh, countries depend on Russian gas. Well, some of them, particularly in Eastern Europe, are are the most dependent or have been the most dependent. And now, of course, you know, uh, after a year of war, most of them have, uh, particularly the, the the Baltic states have uh, have uh, uh, of, are obtaining uh, liquefied natural gas uh, from Norway and and from other sources. Uh, you see that, that even even before the war, this this is um, uh, this is in 2020. In 2020, Ukraine, despite the pipelines, was was taking zero Russian natural gas. So this is a very funny thing. So so what Ukraine was doing as of 2020 was that it it was it, it was having revenues from the transit of Russian natural gas. Uh, to the the west, to 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 the countries to the west, and it was taking none of them. Instead, what it was doing, it was buying back natural gas from Western Europe, okay, for its own needs, and um, that this you know the, because because it goes into into a lot of private trading. A lot of that, uh, there, there, there's undoubtedly, I would bet 100% that, that some of that natural gas can be traced back to Russia. Okay, so it's, it's just a, it's a political game. All right. Um, so you see how, how the, uh, the, 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 the top line is the, is the Russian uh, natural gas being piped in. And uh, the, the, the war, of course, uh, begins here. Uh, February 2022, and you see how the, the Russian natural gas, you know, right after the start of the war, it goes up. Why does it go up? It goes up because, because the fears of the war are, are causing the, the, the West European gas companies to stock up. They want to fill their tanks because they're fearing about, about future shortages. So they fill their tanks. That causes a surge in flow. And then it drops off as Western Europe uh, gets alternative sources from from Norway, builds LNG terminals to bring uh, gas in from Nigeria and Qatar, uh, and from the U.S. and so on. Meanwhile, the United States 
ramps up shale gas production. And, and, and so the, the US supply to, to Western Europe increases, but, a, but much more gradually. Um, what I wanted to show here is that, is that these are the monthly imports of liquefied natural gas from Russia to, to Europe. And you see that here you have the, the start of the war and it actually goes up. It actually peaks in, in June and, and before, before it starts coming down. And the other thing that's, uh, that's interesting is that, is that while the, the pipeline gas from Russia goes down, guess what? This is LNG. This is LNG coming from Russia in, into, into Western Europe. Or the, these, these are the smaller countries in Western Europe. So what we've done here is we've excluded the big ones in like, like Germany, France, and, and the smaller uh, West European countries actually increase their, their imports of LNG from Russia, even, even while they're cutting back on, on, on pipeline supply. So it's just a political game, right? This is what I call the, the pipeline politics. Uh, meanwhile, um, Russian, uh, Russia's trade plummets with, with, with Europe and but but china india turkey uh sort of take up the slack so uh, and, and this is this is because uh, the, the the these countries and and for that matter much of the the global south do not have the same view of of russia that uh, the united states and and western europe have uh, Russia's revenues are are uh, increased. This is these are state revenues; they increase, but so do so do expenditures. So you see that the the impact on the Russian economy is much less than what the uh, what the West expected. The, the impact of the war. Um, okay, so so we come now to the uh, to the uh, back in September, the uh, the explosions that that blew up the. Uh, both of the of the Nord Stream pipelines. Um, it's a little bit difficult to determine whether now, each one of these pipelines has two pipes, uh, and so you think, okay, there there should be four explosions. There were only three, so probably one of them, potentially one of them, is is still intact. Um, one of the the Nord Stream one pipelines is may still be intact. Don't know, but the the important point here is that is that uh, is who did it. Right, and uh, Cy Hirsch, I, I just uh, spent spent the, the time, uh, you know, li listening to to what Cy Hirsch had to say about it, and um, and he sticks to his guns, he, even though there's a uh, that that the U the U S was responsible, despite the fact that that the German investigators and German media. Uh, found uh, traces of the of the explosive on explosives on a boat that that was uh, that was rented by Ukrainians. Um, there's a feeling that that um, that that's a that's a false flag operation just to divert attention uh, from from the U.S. having done this. Don't know for sure, but but uh, I, I, after listening to to, to Cy Hirsch. I, I feel that um, I feel more confident in, in his story today than I, than I did when I first heard it, that, that the US was responsible. And when you think about who has a motivation to do it, uh, the US has, for, for two decades, ha has had a motivation to put Nord Stream uh, out of business, to, to, uh, to uh, put it to rest once and for all. So I wouldn't be surprised if, if the, uh, size um, story is correct, but uh, we, we've seen these images. Uh, okay, J just a little bit of background on Ukraine. You see that the per capita income in the in the Russian speaking areas is is higher. Uh, those are the red areas. The the other one is Kiev. Actually, the capital city is a higher per capita income. The the, uh, the the western part of the country is poor. So this is another part of the the east-west divide that is um, that is uh, unequal in Ukraine. 
um, wheat, okay, the Ukraine being a breadbasket along with Russia for, for uh, much of the, uh, the Eastern hemisphere uh, is, is well known. Um, but uh, wheat production again is, is um, the, the agriculturally rich part of the country is, the, is that South East um, and including the, the, the Russian speaking provinces. Um, oil seed production, Ukraine, you know, is, supplies 40% of the, of, the, of the world's oil seed exports. And uh, again, that's, that's, that's centered in the, in, in the South East. So uh, it's a very, very strategic part of, of the country. Um, the economic impact of the war in Ukraine. Um, this is just to give you a sort of a schematic view of, uh, of things, um, but to, because basically the, 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 the overlap, the intersection areas are the, are the areas of, that would be an economic loss when, when warring parties you know, cut off their, their economic ties. Uh, I'll come back to that a little later, but I want to talk a little bit about the news coverage. So what has been happening here in the US is that um, the, the, uh, even though we complain about, uh, about censorship, you know, censorship in Russia of, of anything that, that, that counters the, the, the Russian state narrative, uh, the same thing has happened here in the United States. Um, I used to look at, uh, at RT, Russian, uh, Russia Today, uh, on YouTube, and uh, on the 12th of March, just a, a couple of weeks after the start of the war, um, RT was was taken down, uh, undoubtedly at the request of the U.S. government. Um, nevertheless, if if we look at the reports, I mean the, the 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 best reporting on on what was really happening in Ukraine was was the reporting that was done by by neutral countries, by, by media in neutral countries, uh, not based in the US, not based in Western Europe, uh, and, and not based in Russia. But um, so what, one example of this was that, was that early in the war, you know, we heard that the, we, we saw these images of the, of the key of television tower. Uh, and then there was a, a missile strike, there was, a, there was smoke that, that came up and the and the and the, the Western commentators all, all latched onto the same story, and they said the TV tower has been hit. Russia has targeted the 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 Holocaust memorial in Kiev. They targeted this, you know, it's an anti-Semitic act, and and that's because the the Babinyar Holocaust memorial is is near to the television tower. So the, there's only one reporter who went back there and checked it out. So. If, a couple of days later, uh, Rajesh Pawar of India Today goes back to that site to see what happened, to see the, the destruction. And he finds the Babinyar Holocaust Memorial to be perfectly intact. It was not targeted. Uh, and, and the explosion actually was 200, kilome 200 meters away. But, it, but, but this story was never retracted. Uh, by by the Western media that that reported the the original strike, um, the only Western media, the only uh, yeah uh, non Russian or, or uh, you know non Chinese media that was reporting from the from the Russian side of the lines was um, was Gita Mohan of India Today. She 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 was reporting in Ukraine, and then she went to Moscow to get permission. Came back in, into Donetsk, and, and spent uh, and spent two months reporting from there. Uh, and basically, what she what she reported was that the same kind of humanitarian crisis that you saw on the Ukrainian side, you are also seeing on the on the Donetsk and, and Lugansk side, right? The people were being affected. People were being devastated. People. Were being turned into refugees, having to go to uh, aid aid centers and so forth. So this this is this is it. So so Russia this is a cue for uh, Russian humanitarian aid at the former metro supermarket uh, in Mariupol. 
Um, so, you know, this, 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 this story was being played out on, on both sides. It was not, it was not a one-sided conflict. Um, yeah, just, just more interviews, you know, storytelling um, about, uh, you know, um, the people's experiences here. There, there's a lot of talk, e even even by uh, by Ukrainians who who support the war effort, uh, admitting that that there's a lot of corruption in, in Ukrainian politics. And um, but but this is this was something that was shown on Al Jazeera, where the the one one thing that that the Ukrainian Parliament created was a, an office of the anti-corruption prosecutor. And, uh, but, but the, the, these are 10 members of the Ukrainian parliament storming the prosecutor's office, telling the prosecutor to shut down the investigations. Okay, this, this is how open the corruption is. Okay. Hey, Sharat, I just wanna let you know it's 11.30 now. Oh, okay. I, I, okay, let me try to speed it up. Um, Okay, so then the, these are stories about 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 women who are who are telling about how neighbors, you know, voluntarily decided to leave with the with the with the withdrawing Russian troops, uh, in in the lands. and um, yeah. So I'm, and then stories about um, this. This is uh, a woman uh, in Bakhmut, in Bakhmut, on, on the Ukrainian side, complaining that. That uh, under the Russian bombardment, she she is unable to receive her Russian pension. So all these years, Ukraine has been independent, and she has been receiving her Russian pension uh, in living in Ukraine. These are stories that are not told. Uh, okay, people who are suffering uh, on that side. Now the other thing is is the the role of of um, of militias, of non-state militias. So uh, this is a, a commander of the Dudayev Battalion. So these are Chechens, and you have Chechens who who uh, who are on the Ukrainian side, and you have other Chechens uh, who are uh, on the on the Russian side. And, um, and and so this so I so I started looking at this, and and the more I dug. The more I found out, and and, and it, it's it, I've I've just scratched the surface on on the role of non-state militias operating in Ukraine, and, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. So what we have here is 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 uh, is here on the, on the upper left is the the Wagner Group. Okay, we we hear a lot about the Wagner Group, who are fighting on the Russian side, but in addition. There's the Sparta Battalion on, in Donetsk, and, the, and these are all right wing, okay, both on the Russian side and the Ukrainian side. Um, and you have the the uh, the Rusich, Rusich group in, in Lugansk, okay. You have the Kadyrov. So this is this is a Chechen. This is the leader of Chechnya, uh, super macho guy. Uh, he has troops in in uh, in Ukraine, and um, the the Russian Imperial Legion, uh, a, a right wing uh, neo fascist group. On the pro Ukrainian side, we have the right sector, we have the Azov Brigade, we have the the International Legion for the Territorial Defense of Ukraine, uh, Dudayev Battalion, as I mentioned earlier, uh, who is the opponent of Kadyrov. Uh, the, the Sich Battalion, uh, the Sheikh Mansur Chechen Battalion. So, so these are all Chechens here, and this one also. Uh, so, it, 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 so what, what's happening here is that the U.S. is supplying what arms. All, all the you know Poland, all, all these countries are supplying arms. The Ukrainian army. Many of these are incorporated into the Ukrainian armed forces. And, and so this is a repeat of Libya, a repeat of Afghanistan, where these arms are going to go into all these militias. Nobody really has control over them. And, and this is going to blow back, I guarantee you. 
if there's one thing that, that I'm going to guarantee you is this is going to have a blowback years from now in terms of future anarchy, future terrorism. Azov Battalion is is a right wing group. This is the this is the rising the the, the Black Sun, uh, that that the that the mass killer Peyton Gendron and uh, and Buffalo uh, War. Um, and then there's there's the there's a UN resolution against against glorification of Nazism neo Nazism that that Russia has put forth for for uh, many years since two thousand five. Every year, the United States and Ukraine are the two countries that, that vote against this resolution in the United Nations. They are, they are the only votes against it. The US is voting against an anti-Nazi resolution for, for its particular reason. I don't have, I guess I'm running out of time. But um, anyway, uh, but, but this is the vote. The US and Ukraine are the only ones voting against it. So um, racism in Ukraine, uh, you see it on, on a, 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 an admission that there's racism on, on pro-Ukrainian uh, websites. Um, we remember that Iraqi Kurdish militants were, uh, not militants, but migrants were, were caught up. They could not cross borders um, because they were you know, brown-skinned people. Uh, Indian students who were studying in Ukraine couldn't get out. Uh, because other European countries would not let them in. Um, I won't talk about the military situation other than to say that that what's happening and the the Russian withdrawal from Kherson was a strategic one. It was not because it because the the Ukrainians won that battle. It was a strategic retreat that would allow Russia to concentrate its forces here, and these are where the battles are happening. Around Bakhmut, you see, there's no, there's nothing happening on the Kherson front anymore. Um, let's get that sanctions, U.S. sanctions. This is just why why U.S. sanctions work. It's because the U.S. has a large economy, and it has a when U.S. opposes sanctions, it has a big effect on the much smaller economies that are sanctioned, but not on the U.S. economy because the U.S. economy is so big. Uh, this is what the real impact of the sanctions is if you if you account for purchasing power parity, um, Ukrainians are going everywhere, but they're also going to Ukrainian refugees are also going to Russia. When the ICC um, made this uh, um, uh, move to to uh, an arrest warrant for Putin, it was based upon the. The, the the charge that that Russians were, were Russia was kidnapping sixteen thousand uh, Ukrainian children. Uh, I doubt that the number is that large, because the total number of people who have gone to Russia is is a hundred thousand, uh, and not probably not more than that. Um, but you also have to understand that that the ICC has been used very selectively to 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 target. Uh, uh, African countries uh, and anything that is non-Western. So I take that with a grain of salt, even though there have been some reforms in the ICC. Nevertheless, neither Russia nor Ukraine are signatories, neither the US are, are signatories to the ICC. Uh, China's position on political system. So, so this is a possible, I, I really believe that, 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 the, that the Chinese proposal, the 12 point plan, for peace in Ukraine is is basically a good one, uh, and and it it um, you know I mean it incorporates the the essence of the of the Minsk agreements. Um, the Minsk agreements, of course, also call for the pullback of heavy weapons, but this is part of the the ceasing of hostilities, the resuming of peace talks, but more but. Also, broader issues like ending the Cold War mentality. I mean, where is the Cold War mentality coming from? It's not coming from China. It's not coming from Russia. It's coming from the United States. Okay, and 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 the U.S. determines NATO, right? Uh, so, so I believe that that's that's a way forward. That that is, a, and we have to drop the notion that, that of a return to the territorial borders of Ukraine before before 2014, because those territorial borders 
are not magical. Okay, they have no basis in history. Um, so, root causes of war, U.S. provocations, U.S. Uh, insistence on creating a conflict, on making Russia an enemy, um, and uh, the, the 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 winner of this, as you can see, is the U.S. has won because it has unified NATO. It has created a pretext for Sweden and Finland to join and other countries to join NATO. To, and then the US is working on other military alliances. We see activity in AUKUS, uh, in, in, in uh, so many other, uh, other fields on the, in the Pacific. And, um, and um, so, so this is the situation that, that we are in. And uh, what is happening in response is that China and Russia are, are being drawn together, but other countries are also playing their, their cards on both sides. So like, like India, for example, India and Pakistan have joined the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. This is unprecedented. Two countries that have fought three wars have, have joined a, a, an economic union that include, that is, that is started by, by Russia and China. Uh, joint military exercises. India joined military joined some mi joint military exercises with Russia recently. Belt and Road. All, all these things are happening because the U.S. is is trying to polarize the world. Um, and and all of this is, of course, is a pretext for from increases in military spending. The U.S. is Biden, a Democrat, the largest defense budget in history, and when you add the DOE budget for nuclear weapons, it's a, it's a trillion dollars. So uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome, we'll be welcome questions. Thank you, Sharat. So uh, we will go now to a break for announcements and Eugene, will you please make some announcements followed by uh, Alan, uh, who usually says something about the website, and then I'll ask Richard Fallenbaum if he wants to do it or if he puts his in the chat appeal for funds. Go ahead, uh, 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 Eugene. And unmute. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Sharat. That was excellent, and I'm sure we all have. Uh, many questions on this. You covered so many uh, topics and looked at it so great. So I know I'm going to be on the list of uh, people who want to raise questions uh, and comments. But coming up, uh, first of all, this coming Saturday uh, is important. Our comrade Gary Hicks, uh, there will be a memorial service for Gary Hicks on Saturday, March 25th uh, from 1 to 4. And uh, uh, if you plan to attend either on the hybrid session on online or in person, uh, please contact Sharon Rose. Her email is on our um, announcements. You can get it at icssmarks.org um, because they need to know how many people will attend for uh, food and other things. Uh, following that, on March 26th, uh, we have our comrade KJ No. Um, speaking on how the United States is preparing for an imminent war with China. So, uh, and uh, again, this is a very serious uh, um, thing in the future. Many of those who are opposed to the war in uh, Ukraine uh, say, well, we ought to save ourselves for China. Uh, so that's uh, something we need to talk about. And finally, uh, listed is uh, on Sunday, April 2nd, uh, we have our comrade Jack Rasmus, who's spoken before, uh, will be talking about the banking crisis. Uh, so, uh, so we have some good programs coming up. Be sure to get on our mailing list at icssmarks.org. There's a place to sign up. So thank you. And uh, back to uh, you, you, Raj. Okay, so uh, uh, Alan, do you have something to add here? By way no. of now, okay. No. How about Richard? Do you have something to add uh, to this announcement and in this announcements? 
Well, I can just refer you to the website um, for uh, any donations you want to make to support the work of ICSS. Uh, there is a button there you can press, and there'll be information, uh, various methods of uh, transferring money to us. Thank you. I'll put okay. it in the chat, too. Okay, but before we begin, I just wanted to ask Sharat if, if you want people to have your email address, please put it in the chat because somebody's asked me about getting an email address from you. So uh, we'll start with Nina Wax. Nina, please go ahead. Nina, you have to uh, unmute yourself. yourself. Yeah. Okay, me, maybe Nina has stepped away, so we'll go to Richard. Hello, White. here I am. Got okay. it. All right, I good. you know I couldn't figure out how to unmute. Okay, uh, fine. Go ahead. Okay, okay. So um, our speaker was uh, talking about various aspects of um, uh, what the United States and the Western media has said that he thinks are perhaps wrong. And but sort of to degree, so it's a little confusing regarding the Nazi situation. He started. Uh, he went through these various um, battalions, or or uh, there are military organizations, you know. But the thing is, he didn't say how if they had any members at all, or how big or small, what kind of influence they had. And so I just recalled a kind of funny incident when we first moved from Sausalito to uh, Los Gatos in the 1950s. There were, you know, five or six of these similar kinds of uh, organizations. You know, there was the American Legion, and then there was uh, the Minutemen who had practices in the hills, and that was maybe eight people, and and like that. And so, um, to say that you have the right, you know, that, that this um, Putin fellow that that it's full of Nazis in Ukraine, and then this our speaker is talking about these organizations, not talking about whether they're how should I say, the numbers they have, how they're integrated in the military, how many in the Ukraine military. So it's kind of, a, it, it appears to me from his speech to be a bit of a smear campaign, all right? So that that I, I object to. And um, and he passes by democracy. And, you know, and I think democracy is pretty important. And you guys know that because I was kicked off the committee to, uh, to have put on these programs and I objected because I do believe in democracy. So I don't really think that you should put down democracy. I, I really, I have a more yeah, um, think, how impassioned view of democracy now. And, and you know, and the, the whole thing that, that they almost hit the uh, Jewish um, body R, they almost hit it, but it wasn't publicized. That is as two minutes now, two yeah. minutes. Is done. All right, okay. so that wasn't uh, said to be a hit, a direct hit ever that I saw in the paper. If you have anything to sell me, I'll, I'll give you my email. I'd like to see it because I didn't see that as a, as a claim. All right. Okay. Okay. So, so that's fine. We'll ask uh, Sharad to respond if you care to respond to these. Yeah. So, so it was that the point is it was it was this it was the, the is that when that missile strike came that, that was the, the the sort of on the spot reaction of of the the reporters they know whom I saw is is that oh they 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 hit the tower and they targeted the 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 Holocaust memorial. And uh, the point is that, is that they didn't go back and, and investigate it further to 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 see what actually happened, right? Uh, as far as the the size of the militias, they vary tremendously. So so some of them have, uh, I mean, of course, we know the Wagner Group has uh, you know 50, 60, 000 uh, fighters on the ground, and they have, you know thousands, tens of thousands of casualties. Uh, others, uh, it's a few hundred. Um, so I, I know that there are, are differences in size, but even if you have a group that's very small, 50, 50 fighters, let's say, you, you, you put guns in, in the hands of, of 50 armed men who have, uh, you know, really uh, terrifying ideas, and, and that, that creates chaos, okay? So, so uh, whether they're small or big, it, it's, to me, it's destabilizing. And, and the ideology that they, that they promulgate which is which is all of these are 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 you know, ultra nationalist or or neo Nazi, and and that's oh, threatening. Yeah. Um, so I I forgot the third. Cue me on the third. 
question you had? Yeah, uh, let's see. Uh, I, it was the way, the way you were saying our media was, uh, oh, we were talking about democracy. Okay, just yeah. What's your third yeah. question? Third question. Pardon? Don't, what is your third question briefly? What do you ask? Him? I don't have a third question. He asked me. Uh, okay. Uh, no, what but about, not, what was, what no, was the not. criticism? And that was about, like, I mean, democracy is something is, that, that is very important and, and I've become yeah. impassioned about it. All right. And okay, so give that, me your email and I'll, I'll, I'll give you my ideas, which because they're afraid that I'm going to say something they don't want me to say because they don't believe in democracy. Well, we, don't want, you know, we don't want to divert. Uh, okay. We need to but, respect but the two minutes. Email, no, we need I'll, to respect the two you. minutes comment uh, okay. um, rule. I please. think I've muted. Uh, That's um, very democratic, by the way. Right. Everybody gets two but minutes, not more. To be going on and on. Uh, so. Uh, I will go to the next person in line, which is Richard Wright. Uh, he will be followed by Eugene. And if I'm missing the uh, order, please bear with me because I have to pay attention to several things at the same time. Richard, yeah, okay. please. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. There was a lot of information that you had uh, that I hadn't seen, uh, but you, you need to re be able to read Russian. <laughs> Uh, which which I I used to be able to. Um, I had a couple of questions about uh, on your slide, on, on one of your slides. You, you pointed out how NATO was was um, was expanding into Ukraine and into Georgia. Um, one of the things I noted there is that uh, and unstated uh, was it also attacks Iran, which is sort of the the uh, the proto. Uh, I mean, the United States went into Iran to overthrow it. Uh, that's the initial, uh, the initial uh, overthrow. One, uh, and and uh, and and uh, and, um, and and what you didn't mention was that the um, uh, one of the Iran analysis papers um, looked at at the Ukraine as not as not like they wanted to win anything. But it was really uh, it was really about the pivot to Asia that started back in in Obama and uh, Hillary Clinton, um, uh, and uh, uh, as as a uh, as an offensive against uh, against uh, you know it was a defense it was it was to prevent Russia from helping to supply China in the impending conflict uh, against uh, against that. So it's very much a very long term um, uh, strategy that people don't really seem to be grasping. Now, I have some other other questions, but uh, I'll, leave, I'll, I'll leave it to that. Thank you. Yes. Let me mute somebody. somebody. Yeah, so, so, so that's true. The, 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 you know, NATO's expansion into Georgia is, is more than just about surrounding Russia. It's also about getting a foothold in Central Asia. It's, you know, the, the, because the, the, certainly the U.S. feels that that, that the you know former Soviet republics like Kazakhstan are are um, you know um, un, uncertain, and the U.S. would like to have a foothold there, and um, so it's 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 a very strategic it's a very strategic uh, you know uh, attempt to to uh, to get a U.S. foothold in Central Asia. Okay, so. I will go to Jean. Oh, okay, well, thank you so much, Sharad, for this. I, 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 there's so much here. But I, I did have a, a, a couple of questions. And the first of this has to do with, you know, the fact that, uh, you know, Russia, when it was the Soviet Union, played the, real, the leading role in fighting fascism. That's one thing that the Russians have always been sensitive about after the Nazi invasion. And we remember uh, Stalingrad. That's where the you know Red Army tore the guts out of the uh, Nazi war machine. So, and, and people in the West remember this, I think. And I think it's something that needs to be kept in mind is the role of the uh, Russia and the Soviet Union in fighting fascism. And that's a real danger. I think, uh, particularly in Ukraine, but scattered around the world. And I think we may have talked about that before. 
And the other thing I wanted to talk about is a lot of this has to do with the oil pipelines, fuel, and mm -hmm. so forth. And I think we need to think about, um, you know, the the environmental impacts. We're, you know, we we're trying to get off oil and fossil fuels. And here, um, not only does the war in Ukraine war itself has a tremendous uh, ecological impact, which is not uh, really listed. Uh, the United States manages to keep its military uh, off the books in terms of its uh, environmental impact, but also um, just the, our use of fossil fuels. We need to get rid of fossil fuels and not uh, uh, exploit them so, so much. But uh, again, thank you so much. And uh, I'll thank you. Yes, indeed. So, so the, the, the so one of the the functions of this of this war or the or its you know results, intended or unintended, is is to to give new life to the uh, to the Permian Basin, uh, to to all the the shale oil, shale gas that that has enabled the United States to become the 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 world's largest swing producer in the sense of swing producer means. That we can increase our production uh, on demand to an extent that nobody else can. Not even Saudi Arabia can can add four million barrels per day of production overnight. Um, I mean, of course, Mother Earth has a way of fighting back, and and that is that that shale oil doesn't last very long. Shale gas doesn't last very long. It it will it will get exhausted much more quickly than conventional fields. Um, but but yeah, you're right, absolutely right that the that the ecological catastrophe of the war is is something that that has not been discussed. The the uh, the sabotage of the Nord Stream pipeline, each one of those leaks, each one of those leaks, and the three of them, each one of them alone represents the the largest single release of of um, of methane which is one of the strongest greenhouse gases in history, okay? So, so <laughs> we've got three of them. Okay, thank and then you. On, on, on fascism? Oh, yes, uh, on fascism, well, so, so yes, so I acknowledge, yeah, true that, you know, Russia played, played a historic role uh, in, in the fight against fascism, uh, you know, in, in the 20th century. Um, but you know what happens is that after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you have capitalism, you have you have social crises, you have the, the same crisis of capitalism happening happening in Russia that you have crisis uh, of capitalism elsewhere, and capitalism in crisis can can lead people in two directions: that people can go in a revolutionary direction if there's leadership, they can go towards towards uh, fascism, you know, neo-fascism, uh, if they are misled. And, and this is exactly what's, what, what has happened uh, in Russia, and Russia is not, in that sense, any different from, from any other country. Okay, so next in line is Janet Coburn, followed by Leo West, Yusuf Gursi, uh, and then Gulden Yazgan. So, Janet, please go ahead. Yes, hi, thank you, Sherat. Um, very interesting presentation. Um, I'm wondering if you can share your slideshow, excellent slides uh, with us in some way. Anyway, um, you started talking about, or uh, early on you talked about Scott Ritter saying, uh, yeah, you know, um, doing his military analysis, but um, and saying that Russia is winning the war. Well, it's a it's really an ar artillery war, and Russia is has superiority in, in that respect. The collective West has been, let's say, winning the propaganda war, um, but um, and and military uh, uh, when it comes to artillery they're not superior um the collective west has uh, has been uh, i'm sorry um when it comes to buka 
um, Russia provided a lot of evidence to the UN Security Council, which did not act on it about that, that it was not Ukraine, but it was, I'm sorry, that it was not Russia that was um, responsible for the um, crimes, but that it was Ukraine. Um, the US has bullied most of the other UN Security Council members to vote against Russia whenever they bring up issues like this. Um, the UN Security, uh, 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 the UN Secretary General is partial to the West. Um, and the conflict did not start in February 22, uh, 2022. Um, there, uh, Russia did not take over Crimea in 2014. There was a, a referendum there, and that was following the uh, 2014 Maidan coup, uh, which basically led to a civil war inside Ukraine. And the Ukrainian military was attacking the Donbass, and uh, there was uh, fighting inside of, of Crimea. And um, the referendum led to something like 90% 90, 90 of the uh, Crimeans voting in favor of becoming part of Russia because they didn't recognize the U.S. opposed Ukrainian government of our two minutes. Uh, two minutes, please. Just, okay, just uh, um, can I just have a little bit more time? Yeah, go ahead, wrap it up. Yeah. Uh, um, the uh, Ukrainian uh, um, president Arsene Yatsen Senyuk. Uh, that's Victoria Newland's Yats. You know that was there. The U.S. Uh, imposed president, and the Crimeans did not recognize that. Uh, neither did the people of Donbas. Um, and why should Russia trust the U.S., Ukraine, and or the collective West to negotiate with any of? Uh, 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 why should Rus Russia negotiate with any of them after decades of, of strategic planning to weaken and take Russia down, going back to the 1992 Wolfowitz doc doctrine mm -hmm. and the actual behavior uh, uh, like NATO expansion, the multiple withdrawals from the out of time. <laughs> Okay, so there's uh, Russia, uh, the collective West has done so many things. Why should Russia, Russia trust them? Yeah. No, I, I don't think Russia should, should trust the West, um, but, uh, but I don't think Russia is totally, totally trustable either. So, so I, I think, but the main point is, is that there have to be negotiations. The alternative to war is there has to be a ceasefire and there have to be negotiations. And, and you know Russia doesn't have to trust the the other side, but I think the Russians and the Ukrainians certainly have to sit down at the, at the table. The the other powers that that, that have a hand in this uh, have to you know be be at that table as as well, or or to play some kind of a role in, in those negotiations. The alternative is continued war, which is ecological catastrophe, humanitarian catastrophe. You know, I mean, I don't need to go on on that. So, so, so that is what has to happen as far as you know the the, the uh, you know U.S. Uh, lying on 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 these things. I mean, I don't really know what what happened in Bucha, right? Uh, all I know is is that is that the, is that the bodies were there. There, there is supposed to be uh, what is is needed, and there, there was talk of it. Uh, I haven't heard too much of it about it lately, but talk about you know the a UN investigation, uh, you know with with real forensics, um, and I mean I I still am concerned about some of the things that that, that Russia is doing, and I, as I am about you know what's happening with the other militias. I mean just the fact that that you uh, recruit. Uh, convicts who who are still ser serving prison terms to 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 be fighters with minimal training uh, is is of severe concern. I mean, they're they're so uh, this there's no doubt in my mind that that there are there are war crimes that have been committed on on both sides, 
um, but but I, I am spe you know specifically and, and particularly concerned about the kinds of war crimes that that that, that convicts uh, who who have been minimally trained in the rules of war uh, you know might might be committing. Nevertheless, the the solution forward is is the thing we must concentrate on is a ceasefire and 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 getting getting the parties to a negotiating table. Could you just talk about the Minsk agreements? I, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, the M Minsk agreements. So that's part of it, as, as I as I mentioned, that 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 it's about the ceasefire. It's about pulling back the heavy weapons from the front lines. Uh, it, it's it's about the, the uh, guaranteeing, you know, the the uh, uh, safe havens for for the for the refugees. And um, you know, I mean, the, 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 another myth was, you know, created by the West early on in the war when when they were we, they were setting up these these humanitarian corridors, and and there was negotiation about the humanitarian corridors for for refugees to 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 get out of the war zones, and and the, the West basically was talking about corridors going to Poland, and Russia was talking about some going to Poland, but also some going into Belarus some going into Russia. The West refused to recognize those humanitarian corridors. And, and that's why, and, and it was on that basis that, that, that they demonized Russia because it was not allowing, they claimed that, that Russia was not allowing the refugees to escape. In fact, there were corridors. Okay, so Leo West is next. Thank you, Sir. Yes, uh, uh, I would argue that uh, uh, the United States has been directly involved in this war since the time of Obama, Biden, and Victoria Nuland. It was also the cause for the second impeachment of Donald J. Trump uh, because he refused to send some uh, uh, weapons that were approved by the Democratic uh, uh, Congress. And uh, what we've seen is that uh, the reaction of the most of the left and all the progressives uh, against a war is always when the war is started by a Republican. Uh, when the war is started by Democrats, they do not take to the streets. Big demonstration were for the war against Iraq, but against uh, Libya, nothing. Against Yugoslavia, nothing. Against uh, uh, oh, I'm, I'm missing now the other. Uh, anyway, the question here is that we have to start changing the culture in the left because actually that's the main problem. Where there's no opposition to US imperialism, the, Democratic Party version. And that's the problem, and that's one issue that is the most important to address. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree with you more, uh, more or less. I mean, the, the problem is not the left, in my view, it, the problem is the Democratic Party, right? I mean, anyone who has the illusions that the Democratic Party is progressive in foreign policy, <laughs> you know, is, is way off base. Um, but the other thing is, is this is, is about how this war was covered, because the, the, the democratic base, you know, this, this broad um, base in, in, in the population uh, perceives war through, through, through what they see in the mass media. And, and uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the Ukraine war is, is one of a handful of, of globally televised wars. The first one was the Vietnam War, right? The Vietnam War, the, the, the war in Iraq, the war in Afghanistan uh, <clears throat> were, were wars that were televised through the, the lens of the attacker, okay? And uh, not only the lens of the attacker, but, but because the, the, the people who were under attack, okay, Vietnamese, Afghans, Iraqis, were were uh, not Western. They were not white. Um, they didn't have Western culture. Um, 
you you did not have a a a, a media coverage that that interviewed these people as human beings. You know, I mean, I, I, these days, I mean, every day, I I, I I'm looking at stories um, coming out of Ukraine talking about how the Ukrainians are talking about what happened to my aunt, what happened to my niece. Uh, how, uh, how they're how they have to celebrate a birthday under under a war or in a refugee camp. I mean, it, 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 this is extraordinary. Um, no other war has been has been covered in this way, which which makes Americans and and virtually you know the, the everyone in the Democratic Party sympathize with with Ukrainians and. Um, so, so we, we have what the other thing is 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 you know how do you reform media coverage, mass media coverage? How do you how do you do that? I mean, it, even it, even uh, I mean, it, it's not just the question of corporate media. Okay, I mean uh, KPFA, KLW, they're all doing pretty much the same thing. Okay, next one is Yusuf. Uh, followed by Goulden. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I have some um, tweets um, uh, and uh, I like some feedback. Um, it was, uh, I also looked it up uh, online as you spoke, that I, it was actually Khrushchev who, who, who was a Russian uh, ethnic Russian Ukrainian who gave uh, Crimea to the Ukraine. Uh, mm -hmm. And apparently it was not done with proper procedure. Uh, and also the, the, the Donbass uh, under the Bolsheviks, it was decided that it should be part of uh, Ukraine to give the Republic an industry and also increase the working class character of uh, the uh, uh, of, uh, of Ukraine of the Republic. Uh, uh, also in Euromaidan, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, the U.S. ambassador was uh, caught of, uh, in a phone conversation where she actually handpicked the uh, uh, next uh, uh, president. Um, uh, and uh, Crimea was an autonomous republic which had the right to uh, self-determination. Self uh, as far as uh, the press, uh, I, th I think credit must be given that in Vietnam, uh, some uh, there were some brave journalists who uh, uh, broke the uh, uh, the official line when. Uh, Seems that uh, in the subsequent conflicts, uh, imperialist uh, wars, uh, the, uh, the the it, it would make sure that this won't be repeated. So that's how I feel. And uh, if you have any uh, response to that, no, thank you. I I, I appreciate the comments. I, I don't have any. A disagreement with your comments. Okay, so uh, Gulden, please go ahead. Hi, Sharat. Hi. Good to see you Good. again. Yes, Thank you very nice much for the presentation. Uh, it's very informative. Thanks a lot. Uh, I have a question that, that uh, you mentioned that there are uh, like 10 or so uh, members of parliament uh, just uh, uh, stormed into the uh, office of the uh, uh, prosecutor, uh, tried to ask him uh, to stop the investigations, uh, including the uh, uh, investigation about the Burisma, the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, energy company that Hunter Biden actually was on the board of directors mm. in 2014. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, since 2014, Joe Biden uh, went to uh, Ukraine so many times, and there were so close relationships, especially around in energy, 
including mm -hmm. the U.S. defense ministries, uh, to uh, set up the bio, bio labs in Ukraine. So uh, do you think uh, the energy crisis or uh, your, uh, you said the pipeline politics, actually these uh, uh, relations to Ukraine uh, of Biden's son and Biden himself played a role and also the kind of fuel this uh, uh, starting the ro of war. That's one of the questions. The other question is uh, uh, Republicans uh, recently saying that, uh, you know, uh, the war in Ukraine is not uh, uh, U.S. interest, uh, you know, against the U.S. interest. So uh, do you think, uh, and they are also saying that Biden is back in Ukraine because there's a dirt on Hunter Biden. And uh, Biden is, uh, uh, that's the reason that Biden is uh, back in Ukraine. So what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I mean, it could be a factor. I, I don't think it's the major factor, uh, but, but obviously I can't, I can't rule out that, that this is something in the back of you know, Biden's mind that, 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 that motivates him. Uh, I mean, presidents tend to, to, to focus, they, they tend to latch on to certain things for, for various reasons that are, that are part of their, their personal history and their, their personal perspectives, their outlook on, on the world. Um, so I can't rule that out, um, but but the but the re reason I don't think it's the is the major factor is because because uh, you know there there are other things like like you know uh, bringing bringing Georgia into NATO, um, bringing Sweden and Finland in. I mean the, the the Biden administration has been actively you know it's it's not it's not just that they that they suddenly wanted to to join. After Russia's invasion, but but that that there's there's also encouragement that, that that's coming from Washington, and um, so so I think that, that you know there, there is a bigger geopolitical picture um, uh, out there. There 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 is also the, the the bigger picture that 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 presidents can uh, can rally public opinion. Uh, when there's a war that doesn't involve uh, U.S. troops, uh, you know, there's there's a cartoon that if you if you're unpopular, then go start a war. <laughs> uh, so I, I think those are bigger factors. Okay, uh, so I'll ask Alan to be the next one, and then I will ask my question or make a comment. Go ahead, Alan. Thank you, Raj. Um, Sharat. Uh, going back to the origins of the conflict, um, right after the uh, Maidan coup, the uh, Ukrainian government implemented a series of measures that were directed against the Russian ethnic uh, mm -hmm. uh, group in the east and also commenced in um, uh, military operations, uh, bombings of uh, eastern Ukraine, Donetsk and Lugansk. Uh, from areas slightly to the west, could you comment on that and that the role that that played in uh, sparking the conflict? Um, the second question that I have is that uh, the in terms of who can be trusted in this conflict for for negotiations, the uh, Russians. Uh, attempted to come to peaceful resolution through the Minsk one and two agreements, uh, which were, as we have recently heard, uh, really never taken seriously by uh, uh, Germany, France, basically NATO, and used as a, a means of preparing. What is it about the the Russian conduct during the uh, this conflict that you feel uh, warrants? not being able to trust the Russian side in the negotiations. Okay. So, well, it's, it's, it's just because the, the, because I, I mean, there, there's so much evidence there that, that, that the Russians have, um, um, 
you know, are, are, are using every, grasping at, at every means to, to achieve military objectives. Uh, and, uh, and um, you know, trying to, at least within Russia, certainly to, to su suppress uh, independent narratives to um, the, the, the commission of, of what I believe are, are war crimes. Um, the, the brutality of Russian troops, I mean, even the brutality to, to themselves, the fact that, that there are reports that, uh, you know, particularly with the Wagner group, particularly with the, with, with the, uh, the, uh, the non, some of the non-state militias, but even right, Russian regulars, that, that they should just, if, if a, a comrade is wounded, just leave them behind, leave the body. I mean, it's, it's, um, I, I don't, I don't find that the, these policies are, 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 um, you know, are, are humanitarian. Um, that, um, I mean, and of course, we also have to, you know, struggle through the fog of war, right? I mean, the, the, all the propaganda and, and uh, what I spend a lot of time is just, just looking at, 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 at uh, you know, so many different sources to, to see whether the, 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 the same story comes through. And uh, a lot of times you, you end up with, you find contradictions and, uh, and you, a lot of times you cannot even resolve, you know, what, what really happened because you, you've got two conflicting stories. But, um, but, but um, war is an ugly thing and, and, and countries that are, are, are desperate to, uh, to, uh, to have some tactical victories or, are um, you know doing desperate things, and, and that's why I don't trust uh, countries uh, that are that are at war. Um, uh, now I've forgotten your first question. <laughs> oh, just a quick comment on the the measures that were taken that were directed against the Russians in the east. Oh yeah, right. Right after the coup. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So 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 one one of them was was uh, was uh, you know banning the. Uh, uh, Russian as an uh, as an official language before it was you know uh, along with Ukrainian was was an official language and it was available for instruction in the schools that was that was cancelled uh, so that was a very a very anti anti Russian move um, the the other outcome of the of the, uh, the the Maidan uprising was that it was a it, it was a destabilizing event because because that if you, if you look at those non-state militias, you, you will see that, that an incredible number of them, at, at least, I would say probably 80% of those militias, both on the Russian side and on the Ukrainian side, were founded, were started in 2014. And, and, so, and so that was a, it was really a destabilizing uh, event that, 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 that has opened the Pandora's box uh and um, um th there's no doubt that they would, would with with the emergence of those militias there was there was terrorization of of, of Russian speakers uh and and also some counterattacks right I mean those those, those pro-russian groups were, were were by and large smaller but um but it, it's it's uh, it it uh, it really uh, yeah is uh, um, deepen the fissures in in Ukrainian society. Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Mehmet. You go next. I will still hold myself back. Oh, thank you, Raj. Um, Sharat, very well, uh, very good presentation. Thank you. I learned a lot too. And uh, now, uh, going back, uh, it was something you said to uh, respond to somebody else said, uh, war is an ugly thing, and which we, I think, here all agree. But uh, we also know that there are just wars and there are unjust wars. Um, and I believe the guilty party here is the ones that started the war when there was no need for this. And yes, once it starts, it's an ugly thing. I think Scott Ritter explains that a lot, you know, people dying with their, you know, intestines in their hands, crying to their mothers and everything, because that's what war is. Now, um, since this war has started, I have been thinking, 
what what else what else could russia have done to stop the war it tried everything i think i mean if i put myself in that position i don't know what i would have done i mean you here you are under attack from many different places and with many different platforms economic cultural this and that but uh even the united states i believe passed something that uh, many many years ago that it says it has a right to preemptive war which means it's not like self defense it's preemptive meaning that I, if i feel that somebody is going to attack me it gives me the right to go in uh to the war first so i'm thinking that in those terms i'm not trying to justify that but it looks like this is what has happened there and again what would have russia done to prevent this war if it's on their shoulders thank you mm. yeah i mean i the the, the example I, I i look at is is you know the the because i i think it's the re reciprocal it's it's uh, in in some ways a reciprocal situation which is which is the cuban missile crisis where where uh, you know russia had placed uh, uh, nuclear tip missiles in, in cuba and uh, Kennedy and, and Khrushchev were, were you know, on, on the brink of a, of a nuclear confrontation. And, um, you know, it was solved by, by negotiation, by a direct line of communication between Washington, Moscow, uh, and, and saying, look, we, we have to pull back. We, we, we can't, uh, you know, let this happen. And, uh, and uh, you know, the, the, the a nuclear a nuclear exchange was was averted, and um, I, I think that um, that the, the the leader of a of a large power had to had the uh, the ability to 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 call up Biden directly and and uh, and you know have a have an urgent conversation. Um, you know the the uh, the, the issue. And I know that the, the West would veto it, but still have the discussion in the Security Council. Um, but you know, do everything in, it, in its power to uh, to 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 raise the the visibility of this issue. That that this is about you know um, what what can we do to to avert war? Because if we don't, Russia does not have a choice. It's it uh, if if um, the, the, another reciprocal situation is you know if China and Russia had a military alliance and Mexico was applying to join that military alliance. Would the United States allow it? Well, the United States, what what should what should a U.S. president do? A call up, uh, you know, have a call up uh, um, the president president of Mexico, the president of Russia, the president of China, and 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 start talking about this. Raise okay. it, put the put the issue in the Security Council. Do everything in, you know that is short of war. To 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 uh, uh, to try to uh, you know stop this and and uh, I uh, Raj, may I may I just uh, yeah, yeah. Follow, follow, follow up very very short in yeah. Cuban crisis the initiation came from Soviet Union and they took it back mm. here the initiation of the war I think was from the United States and the mm. U S ambassador had uh, knowledge and was talking to Moscow and his reports to back to Washington was that if we are if we keep doing these steps that we are taking we are crossing Russia's red lines mm -hmm. so the initiator I think was from the United States that it still begs the question of what would Russia have done to mm -hmm. prevent the war thank mm -hmm. you yeah no, I, 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 I've said many times that that Russia's back was was against the wall, and, and Russia did not have very many options. And you're and you're right. I mean, I I placed the blame squarely uh, in Washington that the U.S. is the provoker. The U.S. was was deliberate in this. The the U.S. knew that that the outcome of 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 having a war would would be would be uh, you know a unification of NATO. And uh, and the U.S. would be able to 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 gain leverage from this. It, it's terribly unfortunate, but uh, yeah, I mean, R Russia did not have any very many options, but I still feel that there were there were some that they that they could have explored before uh, before invading. 
Like okay, what? we're running out of time. So therefore, what we're going to do now, uh, Charlie Hinton is next. And please make your question or comment very brief, after which, uh, with the, after which I'll ask uh, Sharad to respond. Those who have not been able to ask the question, I suggest put your question in the chat. And I'll forward that chat to uh, Sharat, who I would ask, please answer these people's questions. So I apologize for those who have not been able to ask the question, but we're literally at 1230. Sharat, please go ahead, answer then if you have any final thoughts. And I will not be able to ask my own question or comment. So I'm part of that. Go ahead, Sharat. Thank you. My question is very simple. Would no, you please yeah, speak, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, would you yeah. please speak to the saturation of fascism in Ukraine, in the institutions, the governments, the militias? Thank you. Hmm. Well, I, I don't, you know, personally have the have the full picture, but as as I said, the, you know, there there are so many militias that that have that have come up. Uh there's there's uh I'm hearing you know a lot of um uh, of uh, of you know talk about uh, uh, and, and racism and, and uh, the uh, you know, nationalist rhetoric. Uh, it, it's there on 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 social media. There's 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 uh, it, none of this is secret. Um, so um, um, the, uh, the the acceptance of 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 excluding you know other languages. So it's it's not a it's not a uh, a comfortable situation, and and the fact that 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 even pro-Ukrainian sources are are you know acknowledging that that, that racism and and ultranationalist sentiment is is problematic in in Ukraine is uh, is is really uh, indicative of um, of um, uh, of a serious problem. Now that the the uh, you know the the, the statement has been made that that well, the you know the, the, these can't be neo Nazis because the because the president of Ukraine is Jewish. Well, there there are so many cases where where the the, the leader of a country is 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 himself not uh, a fascist, okay, but but they, they 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 tacitly you know provide an umbrella for for fascist neo fascist groups to operate uh, you know trump trump for example uh, gave provided an umbrella for the for the proud boys and qanon he himself was not a proud boy not a qanon but but he he he, he you know protected them or, or allowed them to free reign he, he never criticized them uh, narendra modi in india um, provides a, a a safe haven for 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 the uh, the RSS gangs to to attack people or to attack Muslims to attack um, Dalits and uh, so so I think that this is this is what's happening in Ukraine. Okay, with that, I'm sorry to. Have I've to copied the uh, chat. If anybody wants it. Yeah, actually, I would say let people ask their question in the chat and I will make sure that I collect it in a couple of minutes after the program. And then I will forward that to Sharat. And, and if you include your email, Sharat will answer it to you directly. I will request Sharat to answer you directly. Mm -hmm. So, rather. so uh, with that, thank you very much for participation. Sorry, Annie, I could not include you, sorry. Uh, also to Richard and Yusuf, I couldn't get back, and to Norma. But next next week, uh, there will be more, and you should be able to directly communicate with Sharat once you send the question on your chat. I'll leave the chat open, but we're going to close the program now. So thank you very much. Uh, have a good rest of Sunday, and we'll see you again, again next Sunday for another exciting program. Thank Bye -bye. you very much for having me. Thank you all for, for joining. Sure. Yeah, thank you, sure. Thank you.
Institute for the Critical Study of Society at the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library receives no corporate funding, nor do we have any paid staff. We rely on the support of working class folks that share our commitment to the socialist legacy of Karl Marx. We continue to need funds to meet necessary expenses. Since we can no longer pass the hat at our in-person forums, please send contributions to our treasurer either online via PayPal or by check. The PayPal ID is ICSS Sunday, S U N D A Y, at yahoo.com. And the name is Richard Fallenbaum. And checks may be made out to Richard Fallenbaum and sent to him at 1225 Nielsen Street, Berkeley, California, 94706. Fallenbaum is spelled F A L L E N B A U M. To donate directly to the Marxist Library, send a check to the Niebuhr Proctor Marxist Library at 6501 Telegraph Avenue, Oakland, California, 94609, or directly or donate online at www.paypal.me slash npml. Info for information, write to, to npml at marxistlibr.org and the website is marxistlibr.org.